Hey guys, welcome back to the Geography Academy. Remember, this video is just a small part of a much larger course that's available below if you just follow the links and instructions. Unit 10 is about hot, arid and semi-arid environments. We're going to look into it in four sections. We have it in the first section, which is just explaining the climate zone itself and why it's located in those areas and what are the characteristics. In the second section, we'll be looking into the landforms that happen in those climate zones. Then in the third section, we'll be looking into the ecosystems, the soil and vegetation and animals found there. And then we'll look into the management, sustainable management of different sections of the hot, arid and semi-arid environments. Now in this area here, we're going to see that it's quite desolate. It's lacks of it lacks precipitation, and because of that, then a lot of life. We can see that there's not a huge soil layer over this particular area. We can also see very distinctive landscapes in the background there with these high pillars. So this is quite common in some of the regions. When we look at our Köppen classification, which is this way of dividing up all the climate zones around the world we can see that it's narrowed down into a few of these categories here. We'll be focusing on a few of them here, like the BWH, which is the hot uh, arid desert. And we see those areas there. Um, a few locations to note there is gonna be this kind of environment where we generally find things like sand dunes, very arid, very, very little vegetation to be found here and quite desolate. So. Those areas can be found, biggest areas across the Sahara, um, the Arabian Peninsula there, into the sort of southern part of Asia there, and still part of the Middle East, and then coming down into Australia, areas around South Africa and Namibia, and along parts of the coastline here around Peru, Chile, into some parts of Argentina. And then on the other side, we can see it's all the way up here around in the US and, and Mexico. So after that, then we see areas that get some precipitation. So that's why they are semi-arid. They might get seasonal precipitation and these areas might have seasonal vegetation, such as grasses that are quite common, but still the overall pattern of vegetation is gonna be quite sparse. So those are located around the periphery of those areas there. We can see the arid steppe or the BSH then coming in here around very similar areas as well, kind of like circling the hot arid deserts there. So some of the key ones that we'll mention in passing quite a lot, uh, we'll make reference to Arabian Desert, Great Sandy, Namib, Kalahari, Sahara, Atacama, and the Mojave in this area as well, even though it has the other Chihuahuan and Great Basin uh, deserts there as well, but we'll have a case study in the Mojave. So any of these are absolutely fine to cover and study. The aridity index then is an index that's showing how arid it is or how dry it is in this area. The formula then is a good one to be able to mention that it is all about the precipitation over the potential evapotranspiration. So this creates the aridity aridity index there for this we can see how this index is then used to help categorize areas so depending on the score depends if it's hyper arid arid semi arid after that it gets into like humid dry humid you know and that's out of our range there we'll just focus on these ones here so that's part of the prerequisite then to be studied in this section and undergoes areas then based on the un environmental program so this classifies the arid environments so hot deserts and semi-arid environments there. In the hot deserts, the focus on the Sahel, Arabian Desert, Mojave, and Tar Desert, and then semi-arid desert in the Sahel, Great Plains, the Deccan Plateau. The temperatures in hot deserts tend to be then uh, quite high in the summers and can change uh, seasonally, so cooler in the winters. Precipitation very low, so that's less than 250 millimeters a year, and humidity is very low. The diurnal range then is large. That means that there's a difference between the temperature in the daytime and the nighttime. So there's quite a large gap there. For the semi-arid regions then, it's high temperatures, but with seasonal variations. Um, and then we see high precipitation between 250 and 500 millimeters, often seasonal and higher than the desert, uh, but still very dry, the humidity. The diurnal range then is less extreme than the uh, hot deserts overall, 
Uh, this is often because it can have things like cloud cover and vegetation, so it's more insulated. Um, but also, yeah, the clouds tend to insulate then, so it removes less heat and the air temperature can stay a little bit higher. So there's a couple of factors that affect the climate and the location of the climate and the distribution of these two climate zones around the world. We're going to have a look through a couple. As we're going through it, just make sure to stop in each section. Uh, make sure you understand uh, each section before moving on because the first one is to explain their distribution and then the other ones are to explain the kind of anomalies that are distribution that latitude can't explain. So the first one is very crucial because I'll be comparing the next four to that first one. First of all, we talk about lines of latitude and we have the equator as zero degrees. And then we have the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So those are lines of latitude going across. So about 23.5 degrees north and 23.5 degrees south is the uh, measurement there of the tropics. And as you might already see, along the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, it is, does overlap with a couple of the major deserts around the world. So this is definitely a factor that plays in the role of the distribution of uh, deserts. We can see that uh, in most areas. However, there's definitely anomalies here that doesn't follow that trend at all. There's quite a few of them, actually. We can see the ones up here, 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 and down here. These are outside of the tropics range. And then also we're going to have areas that are very close to the equator, actually, here and here, for example. These are very, very close despite having things like tropical rainforests. So we have to think about the reasons why we can see so, so far away from the equator at the higher latitudes and so close to the equator at lower latitudes. You've got to be able to explain both. Latitudes then are important. Uh, first of all, it starts because of the amount of incoming solar radiation this area is receiving. The tropics then is receiving more direct incoming solar radiation than in northern or southern parts in higher latitudes. Um, it's more direct, it's more intense, and as the sun is hitting the higher latitudes, the same amount of radiation is then spread over a greater distance. So this dissipates the power of the radiation there. And as this seasonal tilt happens, that radiation then is transferred into a new area. So that's quite an important factor that we're going to discuss pretty soon. But it basically means that that area of the desert then is quite close to the highest uh, amounts of solar radiation. Now, if we think about that, in the center, we have the tropical uh, climates. This is receiving a low pressure equatorial low. Um, that low pressure causes air to rise over places like rainforests. The air rises and it cools, and, or the moisture rises with the hot air. It cools, condenses, and forms clouds and precipitation. Now, it reaches the top of the troposphere, and then it's forced to move either side as less dense air is moving in behind it so it pushes that away as it's moving away it's cooling down at the top of the atmosphere it becomes very dense and begins to descend this creates a high atmospheric pressure this air is moving down it goes below the level in which it will condense and therefore we don't see any condensation it's also doesn't have any moisture in it or very little so it tends to descend and it's going to be very dry underneath this creates an area of high pressure that high pressure then creates aridity. So we see then the air being dragged back into the low pressure system here. And it's the same here, the air returns into the center. So it is a convection cell. It continues to move around like that. And in doing so, it creates an area that receives very little precipitation. However, what it also does is it creates areas that do receive a little bit of precipitation sometimes. So if we think about this line in the center, which is also known as the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, this area is not always staying in the one place. So let me explain that. So from this perspective, we can see that there are different climates the further we go away from the equator. Um, this area then seems to be getting kind of semi-arid areas there, Sahel sort of vibes. And this region then is going to see a uh, little precipitation and a little bit of vegetation growth over it there. This is partially because the precipitation then is able to stretch out and reach this area sometimes. 
because during the seasonal shift, this low pressure system moves and so does the precipitation and ends up giving this area just a little bit during uh, the certain seasons. So going back to our uh, atmospheric section from AS, we are of course talking about the Hadley cell. So if you don't remember that, this is a good one to revise to help to be able to explain it. And that's between the feral or mid-latitude cell and we also have the polar cell up there. We're not so worried about those right now. The main focus is on this high pressure system here that's creating that sort of uh, arid climate in the higher latitudes here. The ITCZ is the intertropical convergent zone, which is the low pressure system. So it works independently of actually zero degrees and it moves around a little bit. We can see here, for example, that uh, the zero degrees now, we can see lots of precipitation and a tropical environment. The 23 degrees north and south then is going to lead us to high pressure systems that are in those areas here. So those high pressure systems then matching up with what we just talked about. So we can explain the distribution of these deserts based on the Hadley cell in, uh, in those first couple of slides. So the low pressure ITCZ then, if it was to go across directly, then we could probably explain everything through the ITCZ and uh, the three cell model. However, the Earth moves, and this means that the ITCZ moves with it. In the summer, in July, the ITCZ starts to move up. We can see that here because the low pressure system that was located at the equator as the Earth tilts is now actually moving up into a new location. So this means that low pressure precipitation is going to actually impact this area more than it impacts this area right now. And that happens during July. During January, the tilt is the opposite. So it means that the low pressure system then moves south all the way down. And this creates a period of precipitation with the low pressure system. So remember, low pressure brings precipitation. High pressure brings around arid environments. Now, this creates a change in the seasonality, which means that we get the semi-arid environments. We have July, ITCZ moving over here. And that is creating uh, precipitation in this area overall. And certainly for a couple of weeks, it causes precipitation in the semi-arid environments. Likewise, on the other side with January then, same concept, just on the different side in the southern hemisphere, then causing precipitation temporarily down there. Okie dokie. So now we have to understand about this. Why is it that we have differences then in these areas? Why can the same climates exist across the same latitudes? And why are not all the deserts located where we would expect to find them? One of the reasons for this is the surface ocean currents. These are driven by the surface winds. And these currents then are going to bring uh, different weather conditions with them. So for example, in the case of the Benguela current and the Mozambique current, we can see the Mozambique current is causing warm moist air to come down this side of Africa here. And what this does is it encourages the ITCZ to actually go down further and to migrate further. So the ITCZ dips down like that, bringing its precipitation with it. On the other side, however, then we see the cold air here is bringing and encouraging then a high pressure area to stay in this region here. So the high pressure keeps this area more as a desert. So that's why we see different conditions forming in the same places here. Um, yeah, so let's go back and have a look there. And we can see that is very true as there's only that aridity sort of on the extreme areas on this side. So that creates a big difference there in terms of the formation of a desert and where we find it. And we can see that uh, being the same then in other regions as well, like over here, having more high pressure and low pressure on that side. So opposite sides of Australia experiencing different conditions. Now, it's also distance from the sea as well. So often um, we can see extremes in temperatures as well, and this can impact uh, the change on either side. So it can have a really profound effect there. The land-sea difference then can cause the ITCZ to migrate further up. 
Um, and this creates a high low pressure system over areas like Asia, which is why we start to see some deserts which are in higher latitudes around here, some colder deserts that are there, um, or at least they have warm summers and cold uh, winters. So they're quite different and at different latitudes here. And we can also see the ITCZ dipping down in this area here and just showing us more of a reason why there's such arid climates on this side and not on the other side. So this motion then can change the ITCZ and the difference between an arid and semi-arid environment and its location. The other one to take into account then is altitude. We can see this with major mountain ranges. So what we can find is that in one side of the mountain, air will be uh, encouraged to move up. It will pass its dew point. It will condense. It will start to rain on one side of the mountain. So here we can see air might be moving in here, moist air from the oceans, it reaches the Himalayas, it goes straight up, causes snow and other precipitation types to form. And this causes and creates then a great accumulation of snow and, and precipitation on one side. On the other side, the leeward side, the air starts to move down, it goes below the dew point, so it won't condense, but also it's lost a lot of its moisture too. So there's not much chance of it uh, bringing much precipitation there as it moves downwards. This leaves less precipitation on this side and the development of arid environments over the other side of these great mountains. We can see it happening here as well when we look at the coast of South America. And we can see the arid environments follow the coastline all the way down. A few things are happening. One, you've got the Andy Mountains, which separate then the uh, rainforest deserts um, because that has the area of low pressure. It also has a cold current coming up the coastline here, which helps to create a high pressure zone throughout the coastline here. And this means it can go up to really high latitudes right up to the equator. So there is, that's a very quick video and a very quick introduction to complex ideas. The concept now for you is to go back and to take it slowly. Make sure that you're learning one slide after the other, that you're absolutely fine without moving on or before moving on. Um, just like in AS with the atmosphere and weather unit, it just takes a while to get these general concepts. So take your time, review the information, make sure you're good at each step-by-step -step process, explain everything in those kind of steps as well, and you might find then that it makes a bit more sense quicker. This isn't the easiest thing to understand atmospheric changes and influences over those, and I absolutely just blazed through that. That's like a, a week of schoolwork, right, in less than 20 minutes. So it's okay if you didn't understand that, and um, definitely go back and have a quick revision over all the concepts. Make sure that you just take it easy and do it step by step.